from lunch. Hope you had a great break and I hope you're enjoying this amazing conference as much as I am. We wanted to take a little bit of time to uh, honor our 2021 local food leader graduates. Uh, and so uh, my name is Melissa Clampett. I am a program coordinator for the University of Alaska Fairbanks Cooperative Extension Service and uh, I am located at the Matanuska Experiment Farm and Extension Center in Palmer. And we have amazing things going on there. Uh, and so I recommend you uh, check out our booth later, on, not just to learn about the local food leader course, but also to see all the amazing things that uh, the Experiment Farm and Extension is doing around the state and in the Matsu Valley. Okay, enough commercials uh, about the Local Food Leader course. I wanted to give you a tiny history before we honor our graduates. Uh, we partner with Iowa State University, and uh, this has been going on since about 2018. They started a pilot program, and Alaska was one of the states that was able to participate. And at that time, Rachel Miller from APU, uh, Sarah Reynard from Alaska Seeds of Change, and myself, we all became certified local food leaders. And we really wanted to bring the course to Alaska and kind of Alaskify it, uh, because what really worked um, in the lower 48 doesn't necessarily work here in Alaska, as we all have been talking about this weekend. Uh, so anyway, uh, last year, Jody Anderson, the then director of the Matanuska Experiment Farm and Extension Center, became a trainer, and she and I were able to offer this course through Extension, uh, Cooperative Extension, and we were wanting to uh, make it available for anyone who's interested in working in the food system to improve their skills and to, um, you know, just build better leaders. And thanks to AFMA and the Alaska Food Policy Council for their generous donations, we were able to offer scholarships for everyone who participated in our course. We had 20 participants, and this is a very labor intensive course. And uh, we actually had nine people graduate with a certificate and we were super stoked. So um, let's get on to our graduates, our first, uh, graduate. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, we have people all over the state. This is where our nine graduates are located, if you take a peek. Uh, pretty cool. We have good representation, but as you can see, uh, some of our state hasn't um, been covered, so there's opportunities there. All right, let's get on to our next slide. Uh, most of you might recognize this face, Robbie Mixon. She currently resides on Denina and Subiac lands in Homer, Alaska. And uh, she's recently quote unquote retired from directing the Homer far farmer's market for the last decade. She is the first ever part-time executive director of the Alaska Food Policy Council. And she's also the local foods director for Cook Inlet Keeper, which is a regional nonprofit organization. And there she started one of the state's first food hubs, which is now beginning its seventh season. Robbie is uh, also relaunched the Alaska Farmers Market Association and is working with farmers on Alaskanizing salmon safe agricultural practices. She envisions a food system that is operated sustainably and accessibly to all. And really she's dedicated her entire work life to helping achieve this goal. And I do wanna say Robbie is also a newly trained trainer for the local food leader course and will be helping teach a course later this year. So let's give it up for Robbie. Woo um, okay, our next graduate. I, and I also want to encourage you guys, um, as you see their slides, their contact information is on there, reach out to them. They are a huge resource. So um, our next 
uh, graduate is T. Khan Galbraith, and you'll probably recognize him as well because he has had a huge part in the youth track uh, of this conference and setting that up. Um, T. Khan is located in Anchorage, Alaska. He is Atna Athabaskan and a tribal member of the Montasta Lake Traditional Council. In his role as a technical assistant specialist for the Intertribal Agricultural Council, he supports the 229 tribes throughout Alaska to help accomplish resilience through agriculture. Tikan is currently engaged with multiple projects focused on food security in Alaska that range from grassroots efforts, promoting individual engagement with gardening and subsistence practices, uh, to advocacy around policy change that will support increased access programming that supports food security in our state. So let's give it up for Tikan. Woo -woo. All right, our next gra graduate is Lauren Giroux. Lauren is originally from Eastern Iowa, but she moved to Homer, Alaska in 2017. And Lauren's passion for building food resilience actually started during her undergraduate studies at the University of Iowa, where she had a fellowship that got her involved in advocating for food equity. Lauren is currently the director of the Homer Farmers Market, which is a, and a huge part of that role is expanding access to healthy locally grown food within our community. So let's give it up for Lauren on the food equity piece. All right, our next graduate is Amy Knapp Pettit. Amy was raised on a cow calf operation on the Southern Oregon coast and graduated from Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Business Management in 2003. Uh, working for the State Division of Agriculture for a decade, Amy led the marketing camp development team, was a founding member of the Alaska Food Policy Council, and she sat on the North American Agricultural Marketing Officials Executive Board. For six years, beginning in 2015, Amy thrived in her role at the Alaska Farmland Trust, permanently protecting valuable agricultural lands and promoting industry across multiple platforms and educating fellow Alaskans like me on the importance of our food system. And Amy is currently working as the state executive director at the USDA Farm Service Agency. Give it up for Amy and congrats on that appointment. That's awesome. All right, our next graduate is Megan Geary. Now, I know you guys will recognize this name because Megan is the guru of Whova and all things happening with this conference. So if you are watching this, uh, then you can thank Megan for that. She's She's been awesome for this. So thank you so much, Megan. Uh, as a lifelong Alaskan who's lived in many regions of the state, Megan has seen firsthand how fruitful our farms and producers are and how food insecure we are. She has been involved in agricultural agriculture for nearly seven years now, having started her career at the Muskox Farm in Palmer as an interpretive guide. The Division of Agriculture hired Megan as an intern for the marketing department and the Alaska Grown Program, while she worked on her undergraduate degree at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She graduated in 2019 with her degree in English and secondary education, and in the same year, she became the local foods coordinator for the Alaska Farmers Market Association, and Megan is rocking it, so um, give it up for Megan. All right, our next graduate is Michaela Clark. Michaela is originally from a small town in rural New Hampshire, uh, but she's currently in Anchorage, and she studied sustainable food systems and agriculture in college and has since worked in various sectors of the food system, including farming and nonprofit work. Uh, as I said, she currently lives in Anchorage and she does food systems work in the Aleutian Pribilof Islands. Give it up for Michaela. All right, our next graduate is 
Kira Hardy. Next slide, please. Thanks. All right, Kira, she currently resides in Homer, Alaska, and she is the Alaska Food Hub's local foods coordinator and Salmon Fest radio sound engineer, editor, and producer. So thank her for all that amazing work that happens with Salmon Fest and being able to get it out there. Um, Kira graduated from the University of Minnesota D Duluth in 2016 with a major in public health education and promotion and with a minor in art. And she is excited to help sustain the Alaska Food Hub connection between producers and consumers for our health, for our climate, and for our economy. Let's give it up for Kira. All right, our next, uh, next graduate is Erica Merklin. And Erica is a permaculturalist and a master gardener who utilized her knowledge and skills to create a victory garden, which is a community garden in Haines, Alaska. She is also a regional node leader for the AFPC, working toward establishing a local food hub and food council. Give it up for Erica. Good work, Erica. And then lastly, um, we have Sue Chasen, and Sue is um, in Haines, Alaska, and she's currently working on projects other than food systems work. But I have to tell you, Sue is a rock star, and uh, she's a retired um, professor, a scientist, and she has really, um, she was a rock star in the whole program. She really gave us so much input and uh, really helped us out so much. So props to Sue. All right, everyone, these are our nine graduates. Um, I think I have a takeaway slide. Maybe. Do I? Next I don't slide? think so. Okay, well, let's, let's turn the slides off then. Uh, we did have a few takeaways from our course. Uh, as I said, we had 20 people um, start out, but it's labor intensive. And the first thing we realized is timing is everything. Uh, you might have seen that uh, on the very first slide, it was, um, we offered it May through August. And as all of you know, that's like the busiest time for producers and um, people who are super involved in the food system. And so um, it, it it was a very, very intensive time. We learned that timing really is important. And so our, our plan this time is to offer it uh, in the fall slash winter, where hopefully people aren't quite as strapped for time and trying to, um, trying to produce some amazing agriculture. Uh, the next thing that we learned is networking was a huge, huge part of this course. And so uh, we will also, we did offer some the ability to uh, just do the workshops and to um, audit the course. And we're, I think we'll open that up for more people because networking seemed to be a huge piece of the, uh, of the pie. And then lastly, I just want you guys to know there's so much amazing work happening in Alaska. And it was so fun to hear from all our participants about what they're involved in and, and to see them grow throughout the process. Uh, these food leaders really are promoting change and growth to ensure Alaska's food system is vibrant and resilient and sustainable. And they really do uh, deserve to be celebrated. So reach out to them. If you have questions about local food leader, ask them or contact me uh, directly. I'd be happy to, um, to give you some more information. But for now, let's just um, cheer on our graduates and all the work they're doing and um, keep up the good work, everyone. Thanks so much. And I think I'm turning it to Rachel. Thanks, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rachel Miller with the Alaska Food Policy Council. I sit on the governing board and this is this is the coolest conference. Everyone's doing great. The sessions have been amazing. Um, this conference is an enormous lift that starts a year in advance. We have people from all over the state who weigh in with their time, energy and money to help this event happen. And so I'm just here to briefly recognize the folks who you see on the screen right now. We had 
people showed up for the game. They showed up to sponsor us in, again, um, in kind and financially. And so I'll just read our list. Um, we just really want to thank each and every sponsor, presenter, and volunteer who made this happen. Um, special thank you goes out to our volunteer planning committee and their host organizations who afforded them time to do this. Again, this has taken over a year to plan um, and from moderating conference sessions to fundraising, we could, we, we could not have done this um, without each and every one of you. So many thanks to especially our conference coordinators, gurus, mavens, whatever amazing title you want to give them, Megan Geary and Robbie Mixon. Um, thanks for keeping all the pieces together and hurting all of the cats that, <laughs> that I'm sure you wanted to put in a bag at some point. Um, we'd like to extend gratitude for our 2022 conference co-presenters, the Intertribal Agriculture Council and the University of Alaska Anchorage Dietetics and Nutrition Department. You've heard from Melissa Klupach and T. Con Galbraith today um, throughout this conference, and they were instrumental in bringing resources to the table. Um, so thank you to these sponsors who have provided significant financial support for the 2022 conference, uh, the Alaska Commercial Company, and go ahead and clap in, clap in the chat, show them your recognition, Alaska Commercial Company, the State of Alaska Department of Health and Human Services, CARS, Safeway, the Alaska Farmers Market Association, Alaska Seeds of Change, NANA Management Services, Alaska MEP, the Manufacturing Extension, partnership, uh, World Wildlife Fund, and the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And to the many more sponsors you see on the screen, so much gratitude. Thank you. So thanks to all of you, our attendees, for being with us, being here with us this week. And we look forward to continuing to build a more resilient food system for our state and our communities. So thanks a lot. And I will now turn it back over to the powers that be, to Brad St. Pierre. Hey everybody, I'm so excited and honored I get to introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm Brad St. Pierre, I'm a farmer in Fairbanks. I, my wife and I own and operate Goosefoot Farm. It's a diversified vegetable farm. We use uh, regenerative practices and sell through our CSA and at our local farmer's market. I also have the honor to be the general manager of the Tanana Valley Farmers Market here in Fairbanks, and I'm currently serving as the Alaska Farmers Market's board president. And um, if uh, you are a market supporter or a market uh, vendor or manager, uh, our website, alaskafarmersmarkets.org, is an amazing resource. We have a great map of farmers markets across the state. Alaska has seen a huge increase in markets and in farmers at markets over the last 10 years. Um, we're hosting a, uh, our 2022 Gather and Grow Summit coming up in April. And uh, it's a no cost one day summit. It's jam packed of amazing Alaskan speakers, national speakers and other sessions. So please join us, you're all welcome. Um, I'm not only a farmer and market manager and working on a board, but I'm the son of a political refugee from Cuba and a long way from my parents' home, but um, now Alaska is my home. Um, and I have the great honor to introduce uh, our next speaker, Helga Garcia Garza. Um, Helga is uh, the executive director for the La uh, the executive director for the Agricultura Network and the uh, La Cosecha CSA in central New Mexico. Uh, Helga has a vision for food justice for the underserved Hispanic and native community in her area as a member of the native indigenous community there with more than two decades of experience uh, working in organic uh, uh, but yes, <laughs> in her community, she's been working as a, an activist and an organizer in um, uh, environmental justice and has worked for the Agricultura member farms in tracking quality control and distribution. Uh, for the last 30 years, she's been dedicated to community health initiatives on both sides of the US Mexico region. Uh, educating folks on the right to know, right to act, 
regarding water and land and air contamination. Uh, Helga uh, bases her work on a from the ground up approach to building an environmental economy. And has, she believes the nutritional needs of her community are best served by local farmers who grow healthy, culturally appropriate food using organic and sustainable practices. Um, Helga is a New Mexico Food and Ag Policy Council Chair, and she's a Castaña Fellow and a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Cultural of Health Leader Fellow. And uh, not only am I proud, but it gives me goosebumps to introduce Ms. Helga. Uh, welcome to Alaska and welcome to our conference. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. I am excited and honored that I was asked to be a keynote speaker. I am um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, land of the Tewa people, and honoring our longevity as native communities here in Albuquerque, I greet you all in my native language. Each clan cinco en Toteotatsin, each clan cinco en Toteopilsin, each clan cinco en Toteo Yehuatzin y Panemuani. Again, I am honored to be able to share our story of how we have through the self-determination of our community and our people rooted in our traditional culture and value and the original teachings that we have passed down through generations, facing many obstacles of genocide, facing many obstacles of land theft, facing many obstacles to be here on this day to tell you our story. Um, I'm a little, not so tech, so I got my tech person here. This is Jessica, who will be helping me out. Okay, we begin here in our community. We are in the South Valley of Albuquerque. Even though our address says Albuquerque, we are in what is called the unincorporated parts of Bernalillo County. Over the past 25 years, South Valley has been given the opportunity to vote if we want to become part of Albuquerque. And all three times our community has voted it down no. And why? Because we would lose our agricultural way of life. We would lose our water rights. We would lose the ability to have animals within our home and within our communities. Um, it's not normal to see horses alongside waiting on a red light with you. Um, so our community has been resilient and we've been left out of economic, uh, eco being able to build an economy within the South Valley. So we've been left on our own for all these years. Um, have to face um, unhealthy zoning when it comes to Superfund sites and Brownsville sites here. We are surrounded by that. But Albuquerque itself is surrounded by 19 native pueblos. And the 19 native pueblos all maintain our language all maintain our ceremonial agricultural calendars, and we maintain those original teachings that we received throughout these generations on how it is our responsibility to take care of our way of life, our communities, and what sustains our life. And I think that's why we're all here because we know what really sustains our lives here. Um, I have hold no degrees whatsoever in the Western way, but what I do hold is ancestral knowledge in the food system. So that is why 
This building right here um, is the South Valley Economic Development Center. And when I come and say self-determination of people, this is the story I lay out for you. I was part of the community 30 years ago when this building was being talked about as a possibility to be here in the South Valley for food development, uh, entrepreneurs that could start their business, dealing with whatever aspect of the food chain they were trying to start a business in. So the South Valley Economic Development Center is what, it's not me, no. Sorry, folks. Um, in 28, um, it was flagged and identified that we were coming to our last generation of traditional farmers. And why? Because people could no longer sustain their livelihood within farming. So we had a resurgence. We did a farm training program led by a very knowledgeable, respected elder in our community who runs the Santa Cruz farm, uh, Mr. Don Bustos. He took 10 of our young folk um, under his wing and we started that farm training program. That what came out of that farm training program is how we formed what is now Agricultura Cooperative Network. We started with three farms and a theory of how we could make it work. Our mission was to have this resurgence of traditional farmers growing traditional foods um, and how we were going to keep it local and build an economy around it. We had to, when we represent 40 small farms, and when I say small farms, I mean a quarter of an acre, a hoop house, uh, our largest farms are maybe three acres. And it was that collective effort and that vision and going and rooted in those traditional guiding principles handed down to us through generations. Keep our food local, keep building capacity of our farmers and farmers working together to meet larger markets. In 2010, is when the state of New Mexico legislative body really started to make an effort in listening after years of our presentations to them of how we needed institutional support. And after putting all the data of how much the city of Albuquerque, how much Bernalillo County, how much all the institutions spend yearly on food, that was, our, that was our pathway to making change, to build capacity of the farmers, to build an environmental economy, to work on the mind change set that we had to do on healthy eating and active living. So in 2012, in 2010 was the first funding that came in for Farm to School. So that was our opportunity to put our theory into practice. Can we really do this collectively? Can we really meet that market of public education departments? So we made a partnership with the South Valley Economic Development Center, which I am still blown away every time I come into this building. And it takes me back 30 years when we were just talking about this building. So again, the lesson there was the commitment it takes to making change. In 2012, um, we had our cooperative a little bit stronger. We were meeting the PED um, markets. We were in a facility that lends itself to us to be able to grow a cooperative and network of farmers. This facility, because it is uh, focused on food development, local food development and food entrepreneurs, it allowed us to meet all the permitting necessary in order to market raw produce. 
And it also gave us the infrastructure of space, cold storage, dry storage, freezer capacity, all of those pieces. So in 2012, uh, we started a CSA. And the reason we started the CSA, because a lot of the neighbors, the South, let me go back a little bit, the South Valley has a long history of its strength being agricultural and small ranching. We are communities along the Rio Grande. So in 2012, a lot of our, as the resurgence of farms were happening here in the South Valley, these were farms that were asleep and got full of weeds and trees. So community started to work on all of these small little farms to make them active again. But yet we still weren't rooted strong enough in our community. Community members started to say, why is that food leaving our South Valley? Well, because the farmers could get a, a living wage um, market price outside of the South Valley. So Mr. Don Bustos, who continues to be a guiding force for us said, well, there's a thing called community supported agriculture and it is surfacing up around um, all parts of the US and maybe we should look into that. So we did. We wanted to keep it equitable. We wanted to keep it local. And it also gave us the opportunity to do that. We started with 20 families in 2012. To date, we're 320 families on a weekly basis. And for us, it was that equity piece. How do we get it to the folk that so desperately need it, but don't have the resources for it? We made it snap. Uh, opened up that avenue for SNAP participation. New Mexico participates in the double up food bucks, which is, which is connected to the SNAP. So it lowers the price even more for our community. Today, a $30 bag can come to them as low as $3 when they pay with SNAP and the double up food bucks. And people always tell, well, I've been told this before. Oh, it's working because it's a subsidized program. And I say, people can take that SNAP benefit and spend it anywhere. They choose to invest in our South Valley farmers. And they make a commitment to the program. Um, and we run a 25 week CSA during our peak season. And they commit to those 25 weeks. Um, and this is how we've been building the capacity of the farmers. Uh, because it is our South Valley farms feeding these um, CSA. And then we also do CSA for many other mutual aid groups that find their own funding, come to us and say, can we have a hundred bag? Can we have 50 bag? Can we have, so we also do that for other mutual aid groups under the, the community supported agricultural platform. This right here, just um, talk a little bit about agricultura. Agricultura is the business, it's the LLC. It runs on a farmer board because no one knows the pricing, the work, the labor, the markets um, that want to be um, attained and achieved better than the farmers. So the farmers are the ones that set the pace for Agricultura Cooperative Network. And um, the markets for Agricultura are again, public education department at the statewide level. Um, the two major hospital systems here, which are uh, University of New Mexico Hospital and Presbyterian Community Health Services. And we work with various community clinics throughout Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Those are our markets. And then we also sell to restaurants, to food entrepreneurs, um, going into retail. And again, the La Cosecha market itself. La Cosecha CSA is our nonprofit arm. It is a project 
under Agricultura Network, but it also, uh, its focus is nutrition education, um, healthy markets, and all the different programs that come under active living and healthy um, eating. So La Cosecha is more of a community piece that sustains the farmer investment. Um, and we also have a farm training program that we partner with Bernalillo County Open Space. And the reason we partner with Bernalillo County Open Space is because through our farm training program, we accept six farm trainers every year and then they can move on to incubation. They provide a crop plan of what is their plan. When they move into incubation, then we help them develop their farm. They get a farm name. We start doing all the farm business with them. All of those steps that farmers, you know, into it, they got to learn how to file taxes. They got to, you know, there's so many pieces when you're running your farm. So they get to incubate again on Bernalillo County open space land for three years where we keep building their program, their farm. They keep receiving help with seeds, tools, workshops, um, all the different pieces that go on after a one year farm training program. The reason we partner with Bernalillo County with this is because as we show how much food is being produced through the farm training program, how many move on to um, incubation and how many also after incubation have obtained land and are continuing to farm or are now producing food for the state of New Mexico. As we might make those numbers, not only in farmers, but in production itself, this is how Bernalillo County um, has the metrics and the data to save agricultural land that would otherwise go to unhealthy development. So that is our partnership there and that is our long-term goal. We have to save agricultural land because we are also you know, fighting uh, bad businesses, we're fighting gentrification, we're fighting a lot of the, what happens to every farming community throughout decades of history. So um, also with La Cosecha, with each bag, we have a newsletter. It has so many things. The newsletter uh, plays many different roles. It's an organizing tool for us. Um, this is the Cosecha runs on a community board um, made of members, made of farmers and made of uh, community partners. This right here, um, and I really like to show them because these are our cooperative farmers. They're the ones that are out there year after year, a commitment from their heart and their soul to this way of life. And as many of you know that are working in farming, it is not an easy life. Uh, the farmer takes all the risks and has months and months of investment before they even know if they're gonna make that money back or even make a little extra money to invest in their farm. I was a farmer for 20 years and I know the farm to market tears and stories that go along with it. You've nursed your, your, your crop for months and a week before, days before, hours before, a hailstorm comes and wipes you out. Um, with climate change factors hitting us, we're, we're um, having to deal with bugs that we've never dealt with before. You know, we're having to find what are the predators. A few years back, no, nobody could grow tomatoes because we had a insect in, infestation that would not let those tomatoes grow bigger than a bush. So, these are our cooperative farmers, all dedicated to growing food with organic methods. Not all of our farmers are USDA certified organic, but they all meet our agricultura standards 
of using organic methods to grow food. This right here is a picture of our farm trainers. This is our farm training program. And our farm training program runs on um, three acres of land. And then we have an additional six acres where we move the um, incubation piece on. We are obtaining another 10 acres of land right now. And the holdup has been our water rights. But now we've cleared all that up. And again, commitment. It's taken us almost 10 years to get water to that other 10 acres of land. Um, New Mexico is high desert. And um, we, like so many other communities, um, are in a water drought and have been in a water drought for 15 years already. So the farm training program also um, is very committed to the actual focus on that we are high desert, that we have been in this drought and how do we keep our soil healthy and how do we keep our water flowing? This right here is actually the place where we have our farm training program. Uh, it's called the Gutierrez Hubble House. And it was one of the first ranching um, haciendas that was uh, dates back to the 17th century. We are on that land. And now there's a road there called Isleta Boulevard, but that was the Camino Real. That is the road that the Mexicano Conquistador came and marched all the way to Santa Fe uh, doing the conquista. So it's very historical in what we're doing and where we're at. And for us, um, especially coming from native communities, um, that conquista has not been easy or something that we've embraced or embraced. It, was, it has been genocide for, our, for many of our communities, continues to this day. So for us to farm on that land, make something positive, bring our traditional foods back, is a very important piece in the history that we're laying out. This picture right here is our uh, New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Advocates. We are not all, there's farmers in there, but there's also institutional dietitians, there's Department of Health people, um, many of the different folks that we all come together. As we know, we need to network, we need to collaborate, and we need to build coalitions to make change happen. So this group right here, not that we all uh, come together in, and um, are at the same level and vision of where we see our food system. We don't all come together and sing Kumbaya. We have hard discussions. We call out racism when we see it. We call out inequities when we see it. And we are educating the body of folk that are in power places to make change. This was our last um, food and farm day that we had right be, uh, before COVID hit us. That's, we've shut down since 20, going into 2019. The woman you see here in the center is one of our Navajo elders. She passed away this year, but she was 90 years old and was feeding community in the marginalized uh, reservation of Navajo Nation. She was doing it on her own with her family for the schools, for the elderly in her community and, and to keep traditional foods that are necessary in our ceremonial agricultural calendars when we celebrate in feast days. So when we were all the names were coming in of who were, who were gonna be getting the awards, her name came up. And they said, oh, well, you know, she's in Navajo Nation, she's way out there. And, you know, so I said, for those reasons, we should be highlighting her. For those reasons, she needs to be at the center of Food and Farm Day 
Um, so uh, this is what I mean. We don't all come together and sing Kumbaya. You know, we don't all have the same vision. Um, but when I became chair of the, well, when I became part of the New Mexico Food and Agricultural Policy Council, I saw the inequities on that table. How I got an invitation is the reasons of our strength and resilience, our strength in what we were doing collectively as people of color farmers and how we were committed to making uh, investments, finding the pathway for those investments to keep our food local, keep our farmers farming into the next generation. So I wanted to show this photo because when I came into the policy council being 20 years old, it was white lead. It was big ag influenced. So in order to make those changes, we needed the people that were trying to make the changes at the table. So this to me is a, a real reflection of that change we made in the policy council into saying our small farmers, we have the data of how much we are producing, what economic activity we are having, and the community health benefits that have ripple and ripple effects of what we're doing. So when we started taking that before the legislative committees, then they started listening to the small farmer and what we are doing. And I say, we are also addressing climate change factors on all different levels by the way we are farming, by keeping our food local, and most importantly, we don't wanna participate with Johnny Seed anymore. We want to maintain our own seeds. And that is one focus that we are doing. And again, COVID, the effects of COVID showed us how dangerous it is if we are not collecting and really producing our own seeds. Um, there's been a big story about New Mexico chili being able to grow up in space now. The part they leave out is that it took the original seed from the Santa Cruz farm that has been held already for generations to make that seed grow up in space. They, they highlight the green chili growing, but they don't highlight that it took that original seed that has been sheltered and produced and taken care of and respected throughout these generations to make that grow up in space. Um, a very important piece as we've been committed to procurement policy change. Um, to tell you the truth, um, I shied away from the policy arena for many years. I didn't want to enter into that, but five years ago, I saw how necessary it was to have our voice there at the table. No one was going to tell our story better than we could. So that is why we entered into uh, the policy arena and always holding the historical bias that we've always been plagued with. So we speak for ourselves. And one thing that I can say about agricultura, everything that we've accomplished so far, not that we're anywhere near our ultimate goal, but we've always been the navigators. We've always worked it to where it works for us and our community. So we've always held that navigation and we've always said, you don't speak for us, we speak for ourselves. Right here with the New Mexico Food and Farm Hunger Initiative, which was one of our biggest battles. And this brought 10 years of community procurement policy change to the forefront. As I said, in 2010 was the first time that we engaged in policy through the farm to school programming that was um, invested through the legislatives. So now we have what is called New Mexico Food and Farm Hunger Initiative. 
This year, through years of presenting data of what we are doing through the small farming entities and how we can and have built capacity within our farms in infrastructure, in farm to market system and distribution. Uh, we have those capabilities and have built them throughout all these years. So last year, the governor really highlighted all those 10 years, 12 years of work. She streamlined all of the state agencies, public education department, senior nutrition, early childhood centers, and made a task force to be committed to New Mexico grown. They get state funding that can be matched by federal funding, but it can only be invested in New Mexico grown. So that gave us a baseline to know that, okay, we got a market outside of our CSA. We got a market outside of this. And again, um, the farmers had been the ones at the forefront, presenting to committees, having our own uh, summits, doing regional crop planning together, um, working with the nutrition directors. Because when we came into this, we came into a total other system of corporate global purchasing. So as many of you know, in those corporate uh, global markets, you can get whatever you want, whenever you want it. You can get mongos in the smack of winter when it's snowing here. So all of the nutrition directors, we started with PED. That was the first thing we had to do. We need to see your menus. You need to understand seasonal uh, production here. We can't give you mongos, but we can give you apricots and apples. We can't give you that type of pea, but we can give you green beans. We can give you okra. We can give you all this other stuff. We can't give you that type of bean, but we can give you the best pinto bean you'll find in the whole United States. You know, so it's educating. Um, at those entity levels that hold those menus and produce them to be able to purchase for real from New Mexico Grow. The next phase, we've done that. The next phase is how do we keep it equitable so that we're not repeating the same old stories of decades? Only the white privileged farmers that have the land, that have the capital, that have the transportation, that have all of those pieces. And we were going down that road of the repeated story. But having the people that speak for themselves at that table said, no, 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 no. We wanna see the data from all of these institutional buyers because here we are, a cooperative and network of 40 plus farmers and you only purchase $2,500 from us? Something's wrong here. So then we started calling it out and sure enough, three of the privileged farms were the ones making all the money without having to do any of this work, any of this commitment all these years for the institutional uh, investment. So. It takes, that's what I say, we don't all come together and sing Kumbaya at that table. Um, we call out big ag. We, three years ago, um, I said, we need guiding principles here. We need mission, we need vision, we need goals as a policy council. And we adapt them, we vote on them, everybody agrees, and then, some of the people that were not happy with us got out, but some of them are, were still at the table. And I said, how does Big Ag, who uses Monsanto seed, exports 90% of their product, how do they fit into our guiding principles and why are they still here at this table? And um, 
Many of them have left, as I said, some of them are still there, but the question is at hand with them. Um, and it's been a, a struggle and it will be for a while more. And the other thing we had to call out when we were calling out inequities, we said, I think we all need to go through a racial equity training together. I said, some of you make racist statements and they're not racist to you, but they are very racist to us. And you can't see that because of your privilege. So we had to call many things out, but all along the way, it, we, not that we're looking for a fight, no, we're looking for solutions here. And that's the banner we roll with everywhere. If it's not working, why is it not working? And what is the solution to make it work? So I do wanna highlight that. Don't think that we're fighting with everybody. No, we go looking for solutions. We go looking for dialogue. And the driver is always the data. That, that metrics, those numbers, and they don't lie. When we know what's going on, show us the data. When they come and tell me, no, no, we can't do that because of blah, blah, blah. Show me it, I want it written. I wanna see where that's written. To, for you to come and tell me we can't do that. So um, New Mexico Food and Farm Hunger Initiative, we've been working on it for 10, since 2010. This year, uh, we had one of our biggest victories, a 24 million dollar investment in food fa farm and hunger initiatives. And that is also going into soil health, uh, workforce development, but all around food and farm hunger initiatives. It's many different pieces working together, but that is our focus. It wasn't an easy, we were in a 30 day comeback, um, in January, after Christmas holidays, straight into a 30-day session. And as many of you know, uh, politics flying everywhere. So hopefully you don't get hit by a bullet there somewhere along the way. Um, we held strong. And this is where we really like, I want to say like, yeah, we come from different entities, different ways of looking at food system. But we had a goal all together and we put our differences aside and focused on our goal, which was to pass that $24 million legislative package. And again, this can be done. You, you know, it's, it's just how you present and how you look for solutions. This is a little bit of the core values equity, community wisdom, transparency, climate resilience, and justice. A priority populations, tribal and indigenous rural and frontier communities, frontline food system workers, community of colors, and children and elders. So running through these slides pretty quick. Um, and you all will have access to this if you want to look through it at a much slower pace. Also within that, these are ancient water systems that we have here called acequias. This is Rio Grande water that is channeled throughout all of the South Valley. And these are governed by community. There is no uh, system like when we have cleanups and all of that. Sometime back, somebody says, oh, we should get a grant, blah, 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 uh, so that we can pay our young folk to come in, uh, clean the acequias before the water flows. Elders in the community said, uh-uh, we're not doing that. We've maintained this water system governance by community throughout generations, and we are not gonna tamper with it now with a grant. I was like, crying and everything because I was so proud that the elders stood up and said, 
We're talking about community governance here of the most precious resource that we have. With that, we also, in building, making change, we have community um, cooking classes. Because when we started the CSA, we had seen how detached people had come from actually cooking food, traditional food, introducing new varieties of greens, all those pieces. So we partner with our local community clinic here in the South Valley that 30 years ago, it was started by the Black Berets in a little tent. Now, First Choice Community Health Clinic has like four or five other clinics throughout the county into the uh, neighboring county, Valencia. We hold community cooking classes there. Um, we keep it culturally, we keep it plant-based, and in, in bilingual different languages. And while this class is going on for the adults, there's a class going on for the children. The goal is they learn the same nutritional um, facts about whatever it is that we're studying that day. They go home with a bag of the produce that was demonstrated in the cooking demos. Uh, we have question and answers and um, all of that. In the beginning, we did go with um, professional chefs. Then the people started saying, they're professionals, they can make anything taste good. They got all day. I'm a single mom, I work two jobs and I got four kids. So then we reached out to our community and said, okay, several of you have been coming to these classes for three years already. Tell us your story. What, uh, show us a, a meal you prepare. And we've been running the classes that way ever since because the stories are just so beautiful, uh, so heartfelt. And even in the children's classes, you know, there's one that came in when he was 10. He says, I came in here because I was forced by, to come with my grandma and my mom. And he says, I like the, the exercise piece, but you know, he wasn't too much into the, the nutrition piece. And by the time he got to be 15, 16 years old, he was doing the smoothie uh, demos. But I'm not just saying smoothie, put the granola in there, put the fruit in there. He took it to traditional food, which is our nopales, our cactus, our tunas that grow on the cactus. You know, so at that point, I felt like, wow, we really made change here. You know, committed to our community, listening to them. Our elderly people said, that's fine. I really, you know, enjoyed watching them prepare that, but I wear dentures and I can't chew that leafy green. I have, you know, digestive stomach problems and I can't digest that. I've tried, you know, so we listen to them and we tweak and we evolve in these cooking classes. The young man that I'm talking about, he said, when I got to high school, I really started to see how many of my classmates were diabetics. I learned from watching my grandparents who were insulin dependent, how we couldn't just eat whatever we wanted to eat, even if we were going to a restaurant. It had to be something that they could eat and how they have to check their blood. And he says the same thing was happening in high school. So now that young man that I'm talking about is in um, his second year at university level, but he's studying nutrition education. So again, that tells us like, wow, we really did make a difference here. But this piece has been so crucial and so important in that local investment from our community because they're not just getting a bag of food that they don't know what to do with. They're learning the value of that, not only as a cultural, traditional way of life, but how we can better our lives using it. Um, and like I said, these classes are, we developed our own curriculum and it is a plant-based curriculum. And this goes to show how they can get everything they need from 
our plant-based diet. And again, this just is a little bit more photos. Um, now we are on YouTube uh, because during COVID, we could no longer have these types of classes. And we haven't held a class of this type since 2019, early on in 2019. Uh, but the classes continue. People continue to plug in, uh, many other providers. Um, now this has become part of the senior nutrition uh, program. So this is like how we evolve and how we work together and how we continue to cross and build. We're moving on to value added production. Um, and this is why, because we've had to really um, develop a year round market. And this doing value added production, it allows us to um, provide more income for the farmer. It helps us to reduce food waste during our 25 week peak season. So now we're producing um, garlic powder, onion powder, um, herbal mixes to, for salt substitute. Um, we do um, various types of salsa with our red and green chili. Uh, we do pico de gallo that's more of a uh, fresh seven day uh, life. And we're also selling those in retail and uh, getting ready to launch a baby food line in April. And we're starting with four. Um, we're doing carrots, beets, sweet potato, and apples. So we're really excited about the baby food line um, because it is a need. And we also, what this, what Value Added has done for us in crop planting, um, certain farms are committed to just growing garlic. Certain farms are just committed to growing chili, but they know what they plant is already bought. They don't have to go to a farmer's market. They don't, it's been bought by us developing this uh, value added production piece. And right now we've got about five farmers just dedicated to growing carrots for our baby food line. You know, so we have the farm training program dedicated to an acre of sweet potatoes. So it's really gonna help us. We're, we're just barely scratching the surface on this, but I can see how it's going to help us in the long haul. And then we play with the different temperatures of the state. How the farmer no longer has to do the hit and miss. What they grow committed to feeding our communities. And now that we're moving into value added, um, how it's going to be a much more secure market for them. And actually we're developing New Mexico grown food products. And how do we become sustainable along those market lines and along that vision? All of our products come under the umbrella of being diabetic friendly and low to no sodium. The baby food line will qualify under our Double Up Food Bucks program uh, because there is nothing added to them. Um, and I think the big, the big thing about Double Up Food Bucks, it can't have oil, it can't have sugar, it can't have salt. Um, so all of our products are under that umbrella. Why? Because those are the major health factors that we continue to uh, come across in our communities, diabetes and high blood pressure and obesity. So these are just a few photos of some of the product coming through. Here's our New Mexico green chili, ginger. We have two farms that have been dedicated. They said, Elga, what can we grow that we need? I said, can you grow ginger? They said, we've never grown it before, but we'll give it a try beautiful ginger that they're producing now. And this we are also dehydrating and making tea bags out of this ginger. 
This is one of our community farms where I'm at right now. This is less than a mile away from here. A lot of our farms are within a five mile radius of this facility where we aggregate collectively together in the South Valley. We also work with our network of farmers that can go all the way up north to Jemez Pueblo, all the way down south to Anthony, New Mexico, bordering Texas and everything in between because we are all Rio Grande community farms. This is one of our greenhouses uh, set on four acres of land. And as you can see over here, we've got, we're setting up an aquaponics. Right here, we're drying. And we've been working with the temperatures, seeing what dries, what holds, uh, doing our testing. Um, just another way to use our greenhouse when it's not being used uh, for seedlings. And as we build the aquaponics piece. So many of these seedlings that you see on, on the left-hand side of the screen, all of our cooperative farms and our farm training program, the majority of the food you see growing here in the South Valley, seedlings start out of this greenhouse. This greenhouse also was funded through the healthcare system. In our, again, commitment to producing healthy food, uh, developing community markets, and un them understanding the community benefits that are attained by them investing in our local farming food production. Just another insight of that greenhouse. And also we have two coal frames that are um, right across adjacent to this um, greenhouse. And this greenhouse, we can control temperature, high, low, within 12 minutes. This is one of the hoop houses that's right on across from that greenhouse. We have two hoop houses. All of this, goes into our value added production. And this is how agricultura as agricultura is also um, building economic sustainability for the organization itself and being an entity on its own because we all know governance, keeping people together, keep learning together, it all takes money. I bring up this picture, we all know her now, Deb Hallen. Uh, Deb Hallen was our representative here in the South Valley. And uh, this was ours before she became, uh, was elected as one of the two native women in Congress. And I bring this picture because I had met Deb Hallen years before she became elected. We were on a red eye coming back from Houston, Texas to Albuquerque. I saw her in line. I said, that's Deb Allen. I go introduce myself and I told her, you have a lot of support in the South Valley. We've been keeping up with all of your policy. And she was all about renewable energy. She was all about food systems, but she was at the understanding and the, seeing the commitment that South Valley had. And I say hours before she was elected, she could have been anywhere with all of her paparazzi that was following her that day. Where was she? She was here in the South Valley with us. She was visiting our communities. She was, you know, this is where she spent her day. So now, even as now she's um, Secretary of the Interior, the person that she put in her cabinet dealing with water comes from one of our villages in Las Vegas. So again, she's still committed to working with us and really understands the plight of developing healthy food systems. This right here just gives you a little bit more on that 24 million uh, legislative win we had. And I'm be honest with you, there were several times when I was like, it ain't gonna happen. It was just looking too rough. 
you know, we didn't, you know, support we thought we had from certain legislators. They did their politic game and went the other way. Um, so this just shows a little bit of the funding piece. Of course, when we go for funding, it has to end up in a um, state department. So a lot of our money in, in ag has to roll through the Department of Agriculture. Certain pieces roll through the Department of, of uh, Senior and Long-Term Services. So it's also learning how to work in finding the solutions with these state agencies. And that's been one of our pieces of really um, in dialogue, coming together and really learning frontline community with the state agency departments that all of this funding has to roll through. That's why we are so key in our language that, you know, we say, no, 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 that's a loophole for you. We're not gonna accept it that way. So we're always on it with our eyes and with our collectiveness. And again, you know, a lot of discussion around all of that, but it takes people committed that really want to make the healthy, positive change for all, not just a few. And we also got to look at how are we leaving it to the next generation? What ability are they going to have to grow food, to eat healthy food, to have water flowing through our acequias? So all of that becomes part of our story and our anchor and our vision and our responsibility more than anything. That's what we have, a big old responsibility here. I lay all of that on the teachings that I have been given. I am a daughter of an activist, a commitment. One thing I learned from her, the lifelong commitment it takes to making change. So with that, I just wanna say thank you. I'm very honored. And anytime anyone is here in New Mexico, please look us up. And I have never made it to Alaska, but it is one of my lifelong desires to someday be able to visit and learn and uh, just be part and see that beautiful state that I see everywhere else. I just haven't physically been there. But I thank all of you for your commitment to making positive change to the food system in Alaska, because it takes all of us together. And we've learned from COVID, the global market is not sustainable. It's been an honor. Thank you.